Well, Saxo Bank Chief Economist Dean Jackism says that if any of the 2012 predictions come true, the market outlook will alter beyond recognition. So you'd better listen carefully, because he's here now <laughs> to tell us a little bit more. And actually, you know, I wanted to start by discussing Apple with you, because you're saying, this is interesting, going to plummet some 50% from, from the high that we saw in 2011. So this is just, you know, your outrageous prediction for Apple next year. I'm just wondering, you know, how do you justify that, given that there is a, a market share that Apple currently has of some 55%, so three times as much as Android, and then 66% when it comes to the iPad? It's actually exactly the point. The point is that no product, no company is able to maintain such a lead to, uh, relative to other players. And on top of that, of course, you have the, the microeconomics of that. It's an open source when you're talking about Android. It's a close one for Apple. You're having Microsoft finally coming into the frame. You have, if you look among the younger people, I seems to personally to find that Samsung is getting very popular as a substitute. So I think it's not, as, we actually love Apple as a, as a product, as a company. We don't even think it's expensive. But we do say is that evolution of technology is such that ultimately there will be competition. Think about Nokia five years ago. No one thought they would ever be, ever be out competing. And now they have to you know, revamp their organization to get back in play. Let's get to Europe then, because you're saying that the EU could declare an extended bank holiday during 2012 because essentially the, the treaty changes or the accord that they reached this month simply won't be enough. And, you know, we've had the, the doomsday scenarios over and over again about the prospect of an EU breakup, but that doesn't seem to happen, does it? They just seem to muddle along. And that's, again, the point. The point is, do we need to go to what I call a crisis 2.0? a place where everything stops because if you look at the fixed income market it's been shouting from the top of their lungs help help something is wrong but it seems like politician only reacts when you have the stock market falling through as well on the downside so what I'm saying with that one is that or we are saying with that one is that we see a 25 30 percent uh, drop in the stock market all of a sudden the politician realize this is bad then they do like they do in Rome when they elect a new pope they do a uh, convene uh, 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 the cardinals into a room and they, they stay there until they find a solution. I actually think it's very positive. I think we cannot continue as we have been doing with the non-solution, the printing of money, the mm. solving solvency issues with debt, uh, creating more debt. So this is actually good news. I think 12 and 12 would be a changing year, yeah. but it would be a year possibly we will look back on as the low point for democracy, economics, and the way we conduct businesses. But Seen, have we, have we been continuing as you described? Because I spoke to the head of global economics for Societe Generale in the last hour, and she was saying, look, we didn't get the big bazooka from European policymakers at the EU summit, but we did get a series of small measures, for example, uh, the prospect of IMF involvement. You have ECB, uh, the S&P program. They aren't taking measures to support the bank. So when you put all these little things together, it could actually have a positive impact. I think you almost have to be friends to think that. <laughs> but the, but the no, point, but she, the point, no, but she no, has a point. The, they the took point, the small point. measures. The point is they're doing the right step, but the premise at all times is that austerity helps. So effectively what they're saying in economic terms is you can save yourself the growth. In my world, that doesn't work. You have to implement debt breaks. You have to do the small steps which is now being in, pre in place, but you also need to create the productivity and the growth. I mean, Italy, uh, in the last 10 years, there's only two countries in the world with smaller productivity. Uh, which is Zimbabwe and Haiti. I don't think that's the country you want to compare, you compare yourself to. So yes, small step is fine, but what we don't need right now is small steps. We need one grandstanding of, let's understand there's a reason why it's called European Union. We need to be European and we need to be in a union. There's neither in place right now. All right, so let's move on to your prediction on Australia. This is a really interesting one. You're saying that Australia could go into recession next year. I, mean, I guess many people might be surprised by that, given that they've done particularly well, especially you know, benefiting from their proximity to China and, of course, the demand coming from that country, from emerging markets for commodities. Why? What's behind this forecast? It's really a China story. Um, Australia is the one economy which has positioned itself to take benefits of the growth in, in Asia. And I'm just back from Asia last week, and, and what is really surprising to me is the lack of confidence in China's ability to continue as if. There is, a, like six months ago, when there was an eight out of ten would say China's in mm. a good place, they have right, the right measures, they're doing all the right things. This time, eight out of ten is very skeptical. And there's one significant change, actually two significant, one being the middle class Chinese is taking money out, like we've seen in Russia for a number of years. So, you know, the actual underlying people who should, should support the system are now taking their money out of China as soon as they have the ability to do so. 
I find that very, very concerning for the growth. And hence, I get very concerned about Australia with its mining industry and, 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 and the like. You know, Seen, just on one quick side note to, to the issues that you describe in China, how closely are you watching the banks right now? Because if you look at what they've been reporting in terms of earnings, it's actually been fairly decent, the big Chinese lenders. But then there have also been these worries in the markets about slowing economic growth and, of course, non-performing loans. Is that something that you're watching? Absolutely. I mean, I saw a McKinsey report out saying that about 70% of all credit, new credit uh, lending done since the, the uh, financial crisis is in China. I mean, if, if that's not a credit bubble, I don't know what is. So clearly, we may have to see like further nationalization, further, again, like we need to see in Europe, we need to see refinancing of banks going on. And that will be expensive because they can afford it in China, surely, but it will be at the price of lower growth and less stimulus going through the economy. Now, another one of your predictions that to me is really interesting, you're saying here Sweden and Norway will replace Switzerland as safe havens. What are, of course, we've seen a lot of flows sort of going into the Swedish and Norwegian currencies. We were speaking about that this morning. Uh, do you think that there will also be obstacles to this, to those flows going into those countries, perhaps uh, central banks stepping in to raise rates or something? When I say Switzerland, I probably mean it both in the good and a, and a negative sense. The yeah. negative sense is that the interest rate curve for Sweden and Norway will be significantly lower than the projection we have right now, increasing the uh, pressure on risk bank to lower their rates at times where they may not want to. On top of that, the asset liability side of the pension funds get in dire straits in terms of ability to fund themselves. So yeah. this is not necessarily good news because you, you get forced into a currency position which you don't want, ha want to have. But on the other hand, we have to realize that Sweden it has everything you want. They have a balanced budget. They have a 6 to 7 percent uh, surplus in the current account. They have the best finance minister voted in Europe, uh, and in my opinion, one of the best since World War II. And on top of that, they have what is unique for Europe. They have their own currency. So should everything fail, I'm not saying it will, but should everything fail, when you have invested in Sweden, you don't have to consider whether you're going to get Dragmas back or Euros back. You're going to get Swedish, whatever yeah. happens. You've got, as you say, pros and cons to that. But thank you very much indeed for that. Thanks very much. Steve Steen Jackinson, Chief Economist at Saxo Bank.